Thank you very much for waiting. We will now start part one of the program, 10-year investigation commission on the Fukushima nuclear accident, keynote speech and panel discussion. First, the keynote speech. What does the final report of the 10-year investigation commission on the Fukushima nuclear accident reveal? By Professor Kazuto Suzuki of Graduate School of Public Policy, University of Tokyo, Chair of the 10-year investigation commission of the Fukushima nuclear accident, Senior Consulting Fellow, API. Professor Suzuki was also a working group member of the 2012 investigation commission involved in the review of the accident. Professor Suzuki, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for the introduction. My name is Suzuki from the University of Tokyo. I'm currently Senior Consulting Fellow at API. And as was just introduced so far, back in 2012, I was involved in the working group of the Investigation Commission. And this year, or just last year, uh, in the, I'm also a member of the working group of uh, API ICJC on COVID-19. So I have been involved in the review conducted by API. And in this 10-year investigation commission on the Fukushima nuclear accident, I am serving as a chair of this commission, so from that standpoint, I would like to say a few things. I have put together material, so if I could start with this, please. So from the nuclear accident in Fukushima, it's been 10 years. So we are conducting a review, and in the end, the conclusions that we have reached is right here. Small-scale comforts at the risk of large-scale safety must be avoided. So we are trying to conduct a review to make a society that does not sacrifice large-scale safety for small-scale comforts. So this is what I would like to talk about today. That's what's discussed. These three investigation commissions, the far left is independent investigation commission back in 2012. And last year, there was this investigation, in, independent investigation commission on the Japanese government's response to COVID-19. And just the other day, this came out, which is the 10-year investigation commission on the Fukushima nuclear accident. And fortunately, I have been involved in all three of these commissions. And we looked at various problems, but there are some common threads. Japan's governance issues have been highlighted. As we heard from President Funabashi, as we conduct these reviews, especially after 10 years from that accident, we are to conduct a review. And the biggest point here is that we should never repeat the same things over and over again. After an accident, you set up an investigation commission. In the case of Fukushima, there was one by the government, one by the National Diet, and one by Atomic Energy Society, as well as TEPCO. So there are many reports and recommendations made in addition to the one that we gave. So various reports are made. And while people still have a vivid memory of the accident, we should reform the system so that we don't make the same mistake again. But in many cases, once you make a report and make recommendations, it's not followed up. So the lessons learned, what we have learned, whether they are put to good use or not, is in question, and that is not necessarily reviewed. What has changed and what has not changed? In what way? These accidents and national crisis, what have we learned? How are we trying to change? We need to think about this. We need to look back 
because uh, otherwise there is no point in making the recommendations unless we conduct a review. And therefore, as the Independent Investigation Commission on the Fukushima nuclear accident, for the first time, an independent civil society. We don't belong to the national diet. We don't belong to the government. We're not constrained. And from that independent position, we wanted to conduct this review. So people who were involved in the Independent Investigation Commission like myself, I wanted to look back 10 years after the accident to check what we have learned, whether the recommendations made were put to good use and implemented. We thought that we need to conduct an examination, and that is why I was involved in this 10-year investigation commission on the Fukushima nuclear accident. And what we have handled are the following items. We had experts from these various areas come together, nuclear power safety regulations, governance of TEPCO. These matters will be discussed by panelists in the panel discussion session, including Mr. Anegawa from TEPCO. In addition, risk communication, reputation risk involved, and crisis management at the Prime Minister's office. At the Independent Investigation Commission, we highlighted how the accident was handled at the Prime Minister's office, so we wanted to conduct a review, and logistics of handling an accident. When there was an accident at Fukushima, water spraying trucks and power source trucks, various supplies, Various equipment for assistance were not delivered on time. So logistics for dealing with an accident was not properly functioning. So what has changed on that front? Police, fire department, and self-defense forces. These are the first responders. After that accident, not just limited to Fukushima, but when there is a nuclear accident, how are they prepared to deal with a nuclear accident? In the case of a nuclear accident, this didn't become a thing, but now we're talking about reconstruction. When there is an accident, obviously there is reconstruction to take place afterwards. So how should we deal with reconstruction? The lessons learned this time is that in the past 10 years, reconstruction after the nuclear accident, how should it be we wanted to conduct an examination? So we set up a separate chapter on reconstruction to conduct this review. So for each one of the issues, we made recommendations. We had learnings. What were the lessons learned? I don't have enough time to cover all of them, so I do hope that you read the report that was published for your understanding. And throughout the course of this review, what we can say is that in the final chapter, I'm making this discussion that on the issue of governance, new safety myth may have emerged. When we say safety myth, generally speaking, it is taken to be those who operate and promote the nuclear power seem to be forcing on the nuclear energy hit on us. That was thought to be the myth. But actually, safety myth not includes those forced on from the promoters, but the general public and the municipalities, the host communities, wanted to believe in the safety hit the myth. Because if they are to accept the nuclear power plant, in their community, they wanted uh, to think that uh, safety myth was indeed true. And that is how we need to interpret what we call the safety myth. With that understanding, when we think about the new governance and regulation on the nuclear power, 
When we compare before or the Fukushima accident and after the Fukushima accident, the nature of uh, the regulatory process may not be that different. That is to say, what is called as homework style of regulation uh, would be the key word. When I say homework uh, style regulation, uh, the regulatory authority will set the homework and then, uh, that is to say, standards. And then when the standards are to be met, and the operators uh, will make efforts uh, to clear the homework uh, or clear the standards to have uh, the equipment uh, put in place, place and also parcels and other equipment necessary to prepare for the contingencies. So when the authority asks for certain requirements and the operators need to, have to satisfy those requirements, when they satisfy all the requirements, then the regulatory authority will think that homework has been achieved. Therefore, or the stamp of approval will be given. And that the plant will be completely safe, will be declared. And that uh, way of thinking, the structure has not changed before and after the accident. So the important point here is the regulatory authority knows everything that when homework is given, the content of the homework, if everything is being achieved, it is totally safe. You need to have to envisage every possible scenario and the regulatory authority must think about the requirements and regulations uh, which uh, would uh, prepare for every sort of uh, uh, the possibilities. So, meaning that if the operators can satisfy all that is required from uh, the authority, then that is uh, fine and complete. They don't have to go beyond that. But on the ground, out in the field, uh, to satisfy those requirements, the operators are making efforts. But sometimes they may think that they would like to make uh, further proposals. But because it is homework, uh, the student cannot make any proposal or advice to the teacher that uh, the homework, the content, needs to be changed. That would be a very difficult thing to do because the teacher said so. So one lesson learned through the Fukushima accident is what is called the regulatory capture. The regulatory authority uh, will uh, be sort of uh, captured, uh, taken hostage uh, by the operators because the operators are highly capable. So they are able to approach the authority, but the authority doesn't like that. So the authority would, as much as possible, uh, try to place a distance between the authority and the operators so that independence can be uh, preserved. So what uh, the operators have come to know and make uh, suggestions or a proposal to the authorities were a very difficult thing to do. But in order to pursue safety, there are certain things necessary. Uh, you need to aim for even better safety regulations. The authority and the operators need to work closely together. Authority is a teacher who knows everything, and the operators are the student uh, just uh, doing the homework. That uh, was the relationship uh, we saw. And that structure has not changed even after the Fukushima accident. So in the past uh, 10 years, this is what we have found through our examination. Now, against this backdrop, in our report, we suggest that what we aim for would be uh, the effect-based regulation. Uh, in the US NRC, uh, this is the concept being adopted, and in Japan as well for or the financial services agency uh, who oversees the financial institutions have adopted this style. They set the goals and effects and how to achieve the goals and effects. The methodology 
uh, will uh, be decided by the operators. A certain discretion is given to the operators. And whether that the method would be appropriate or not, will be supervised and overseen by the authority, and the results should be shared by both. And that is the style of regulation that we need to aim for. Another thing is also raised in the report, the trap of government policy-led the private sector operation. Even before the Fukushima had accident, that the private sector is to implement the policy as formulated by the government. And that structure still continues. But then, if we have the structure, who is held to be responsible will be blurred and become obscure. So what about the nuclear damage compensation? How to press through the process? Because we see privatization and liberalization of the electricity at the market, and that TEPCO needs uh, to make profits in the fierce competition. Uh, we have focused on this. And uh, Mr. Anegawa uh, will be participating later in the panel discussion. I'm sure uh, this would be the issue discussed then. Now, there's another important theme or, or the question have been raised in the report which is the ultimate question. When the accident actually happens, well, responding to the accident primarily will be responsibility of uh, the operators. Where is the valve located and where uh, you need to go through the certain procedures for the operation that is only known by the operators, by the licensees. So it should be primarily the operators or the licensees' responsibility. But uh, when it is beyond their capability, for example, uh, just like what happened at Chernobyl, who should be responsible for response? When the worst happens, worst case happens, how to respond? Do you? Have the preparation for that? Are you prepared for the worst scenario? This is what we also examined. And finally, we had to have uh, assessed that uh, uh, such preparation has not been made when the worst happens, when the operators themselves cannot cope with uh, the, the situation, then perhaps self-defense force uh, with their lives at stake uh, have to be to intervene uh, to stop the accident. Perhaps the government needs to take that decision. Whether that decision needs to be taken or not, we do not know if that uh, actually becomes necessary. But crisis management needs to prepare for the worst scenario. You have to have the planning as well as you have the drills and training. You need to be well prepared for such worst case scenario. So these are the points we have examined through our investigation commission. There are many other things we have also examined. But on the whole, when I try to conclude, when we compare before and after the Fukushima accident, there has been no change, which is we don't want the worst case to happen. We feel quite safe with just small-scale comforts. We think that with the severest regulation in the world, we are quite safe with such small-scale comforts. Perhaps that we here are lacks in preparing for the large-scale safety, that we are sacrificing large-scale safety. We are diverting our eyes from the real danger, the worst-case scenario. And with the Fukushima accident, there are big changes happening, but we should never sacrifice large-scale safety for small-scale comforts. And this kind of thinking seems to be still existent. So in our report this time, we have emphasized once again that we should not sacrifice large-scale safety for small-scale comforts. We should learn lesson from this. 
I would like that to end my remarks at here. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Next, we would like to move on to the panel discussion. Ten years have passed since the Fukushima nuclear accident. What has been learned and what has changed? Allow me to introduce the speakers. Moder moderator will continue to be served by Professor Suzuki Kazuto. Members of the panel, Anegawa Takafumi, President of Research Institute of TEPCO Holdings, who verified as the electricity business the operator verified the accident and led the summary of the Fukushima nuclear accident and nuclear safety reform plan. And next is Nomura Shuya, Professor Chuo Law School Special Counsel, Morihamada Matsumoto, member of the Nike National Diet of Japan Fukushima Nuclear Accident Independent Investigation Commission, who was the member and also the lead examiner. Matsuzawa Kaoru, Japanese Bengoshi, lawyer at Miura and Partners, Director of Research of Nike. I would like to pass the microphone to the moderator, Professor Suzuki. The floor is yours. Thank you. Allow me to continue to serve as moderator. Thank you so much for joining us out of your very busy schedules. As was introduced, we have three members in the panel to the audience, to participants. We would like to entertain your questions. You can find the Q and the A button. Please use the button to raise questions. Give us your questions using here. Those of you who are listening to the English simultaneous interpretation, again, you can give us your questions in English using this function. That your questions in English will be translated, and we would like to entertain those questions in English as well. As for this panel, I had a chance to give you my keynote speech. Ten years have passed since the Fukushima accident. Not just members of the verification or the independent investigation at TEPCO, nuclear safety reform plan was led by Anegawa-san and at NAIC, Ms. Ms. Nomura, Professor Nomura was there. And also, I talked about this before, but he was also the member of the COVID Commission, Investigation Commission on the Government Response. So you are an expert, and we have learned so much. And also from the Nike, Ms. Matsuzawa was involved in the Nike, and we definitely would like to listen to your inputs. So, Mr. Anegawa, since the Fukushima nuclear accident, within TEPCO, what has changed, especially the safety reform plan was announced, various incident command system and other reform has been carried out, clarification of the command and control. Many recommendations have been made. Regarding this nuclear safety reform plan, how has it changed TEPCO? We also talked about national government policies, but the private sector operation, but the, in relation to electricity liberalization, looking back the past decade, what kind of reforms have been carried out so far? Mr. Anega, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I am Aniga from TEPCO. It is a great honor for me to participate in this uh, panel. 
As for the purpose of uh, this uh, the forum, I myself uh, have uh, really, uh, deeply involved uh, uh, the nuclear safety reform plan. I was asked uh, by the organizer to explain on this. So I have uh, the some have uh, the slides that I would like to share with you. Within TEPCO, for nuclear safety, the reform that needs to be proceeded with. That has been increasingly being discussed from the latter half of 2012. There has been many reports have been published before this. And the TEPCO itself has published our own investigation committee report. And uh, what are the factual relationship? Although facts are written in detail, but why has the accident that happened? Why we were not able to prevent uh, the accident? The analysis and observation into those aspects were quite missing. That was uh, the criticism uh, being heard often. I myself included. I was quite critical. This is uh, not something unnatural because TEPCO was responsible or for the accident, the people think that internally there were nobody who would question this. But those who were staking their lives through the process to try to deal with the accident, the people inside the TEPCO, why do we need to be involved in the nuclear energy, nuclear power? We ourselves, many employees of TEPCO themselves wanted uh, to analyze the situation. And there has been a big change in governance uh, after 10 years, and we wanted uh, to make this clear, and uh, we wanted to establish a task force. And for six months or so, uh, so from to 2012 onwards, uh, we have uh, made uh, in-depth analysis it was not 2011 when where we can see the cause of the accident. Ever since 2002 onwards, there has been certain process. Why were not we not able to take proper responses? This is something we examined. 2002, the year 2002, there was a scandal for TEPCO, and we have reflected upon selves. But despite a such a reflection, the 10 years hence was not really effective enough. Uh, and we have invited uh, the, the accident, and we need to, to do some soul searching for this. In the interest of time, I would like to give you just the conclusion. Uh, the plan itself uh, has been made uh, the public, and uh, more recently, I have uh, read the 10-year investigation commission's report, and you have also written into detail and uh, given assessment of uh, this nuclear uh, power a safety reform plan, and it is quite critical, and I have read this, and you will be able to see what has happened. There has been the communication capability. There was a lack of communication a capability. It may sound simplistic, but including the response measures, it is not that that's simple. It is quite complicated. Uh, in the plan, we do have uh, the many points, but these are not exhaustive. One thing we have mentioned is to improve on the safety consciousness of the top management, not just the CEO, but also the top officers involved in nuclear at the par. Uh, the sector, uh, we are emphasizing that we need to improve on their safety consciousness. Uh, this is based upon what we have reflected ever since 2002. Out in the field, uh, the, uh, the managers and uh, the, uh, the directors have reported that uh, we should not uh, let things as they are, and we need the improvement. But including what the rank and file have done uh, would ultimately lead uh, to the safety consciousness of the top management. So finally, I'm not thinking. I'm not speaking of legal liability or responsibility, but ultimately the responsibility should rest with the top management. 
uh, the safety consciousness. And when we look at the root cause of things, there are many uh, problems and issues that we have identified. Uh, the uh, problems to do with uh, safety consciousness, uh, the technological problems, and also uh, the communication uh, problems. And this is also included in the report. Uh, we have uh, had intensive discussion to try to identify the root causes. And we have looked at the interrelationship, the interconnection between and amongst the different factors. On the left-hand top are the safety consciousness of the leaders. For nuclear power, it is often said, TEPCO has always left everything to their subcontractors. This is often criticized. What is happening on the ground? Uh, the capability to respond to the accident was also missing and lacking at TEPCO. Uh, the, the looking at the safety consciousness, the technological capability, as well as communication capability, there are many things we have reflected upon. But there is a measure, uh, the lesson we learned, as was uh, written in the other reports as well, when we find some problem and we need improvement, if we want uh, to communicate to the outside, we are afraid that people may react adversely and say that the nuclear reactor may not be safe. I'm not trying to blame the others, but we do not have the communication capability. We are uh, at uh, the, the wrong. We need to have a strong communication power so that we can rebut and we can argue and explain. We should not uh, try to take anything for granted. We should push from our side so that we would be able to convey legitimate concerns and legitimate information. Well, safety consciousness, it is easy to understand. But people often question, why do you need communication capability? But I try to respond with think to tend to think in more negative terms. We need to cut this negative process, and we have put in some specific countermeasures. And these countermeasures need to be continuously improved as well. It is still to be improved. So in our report that was published in 2013, we have suggested a certain recommendations, but uh, that is not the end of it. We are still continuing our efforts uh, to improve. This is uh, the, what we have concluded, and this is a resolve that is shared amongst the employees of TEPCO. Uh, we should try to better uh, the safety level today than yesterday and better a safety level tomorrow than today. This may be something only natural, but especially for the nuclear power operation, uh, we should, of course, satisfy uh, the regulatory requirements, but we should uh, go beyond that, and we should uh, strive to make efforts beyond uh, that level. And that needs to be taken for granted. Any level will not uh, be satisfactory at all. We should not stop there. At uh, the 10 year investigation commission for the reform plan of TEPCO, there has been criticism uh, being voiced. Uh, yes, I do understand that. I accept that. There are still something in a insufficient. We are continuing our efforts to improve. We don't think that it is adequate, adequate enough yet. Our aim is to better ourselves today than yesterday, and we would like to better ourselves tomorrow than today. We wanted to share this concept, but then people were afraid that it was technologically too difficult, it was too costly. But that is not the stopping factor. More recently, we have learned from Toyota uh, through the Kaizen, uh, their faults. And uh, some people who may criticize that you are doing just to reduce your cost. But Toyota Skyzen has been sincerely had been learned. And this should be our resolve. The present status is not satisfactory. We should not be complacent. 
uh, the, in Toyota uh, Skyzen, uh, something of the waste. Uh, the should have to be uh, totally uh, to be minimized. And as uh, was questioned earlier, as we see uh, the deregulation happening for the electricity market, uh, that the people are concerned that safety may have to be undermined. But I think it is the reverse is true. When there is competition, we had, will make absolutely sure that technologically we need to be far advanced. Then we are able to have better understanding. There would be many suggestions and ideas being proposed. So the safety level is actually improving. It is not that if you put more money, that would not make safety better. That could be true in some sense, but it is not actually true. We need to have continuous efforts. And this is um, not incompatible uh, with the reduction of cost. It is not incompatible with competition. Through competition and through efforts to reduce the cost, we will be able to better ourselves in terms of safety as well. That we have uh, been able to keenly felt. We are striving to continuously make efforts. Thank you. Thank you so much. It has given us a lot of food for thought. TEPCO's reform so far and in the electricity liberalization in the competition, it is possible to enhance safety. Moving on, Professor Nomura, I have some questions for you. In the Stania Independent Investigation Commission and also in the very first investigation commission, crisis management by the Prime Minister's office, their command function, whole of the government, governance structure or governance system, that has been addressed significantly in those commissions. About the crisis governance, you are an expert, Professor Nomura. From your eyes, crisis governance in the past decade, how has that changed? Would you like to give a comment? Hi, Thank you. As was introduced, I'm with Chuo Law School professor. My name is Nomura. Corporate governance was my primary research, and then on extension, including government governance, I have been researching in this field. I'm not always right. I'm afraid it is only my personal comment, personal impression. I hope you will understand. As I have not prepared any particular material. So, so now, 10 years have passed since the Fukushima nuclear accident. Uh, verification has been conducted again, which is significant. Ten years ago, things that we couldn't see, or after ten years, things have been discovered, which has been verified. That's significant for Japan as a country. Previously, Professor Suzuki has given us a presentation, the homework type of regulation, and the new safety myth. When the next crisis comes, what we should we be, be really wary of those things most, Anne, and I think that's something that I have learned personally from your presentation. With regard to the questions you have posed, this is how I feel. To give you a conclusion, regarding Japan's crisis management, not much progress has been made. I think that's the current situation. There are several reasons. First, fundamentally, crisis or contingency that should be defined firmly and the response measures must be discussed. It's still regarded as kind of taboo in Japan, and I think that's a fundamental reason. Why is it regarded as a kind of taboo? In Japan, war was caused, and then a lot of damages have been done to various countries abroad. That's the heavy history. 
we have that verification of that history has not been conducted and then post war democracy under that particular concept Japanese people have learned many things GHQ policies war build program to make sure that Japan will never wage war. That kind of a consciousness change or reform has been conducted uh, based on a deep, deep soul searching. So somewhere in our mind, we have this preconceived notion that we should never discuss contingency. But if you look at the international community, it is not such a simple, simply made. We don't really know that Japan may be involved in contingency. Nuclear accident is one, a pandemic is another. When will we face a crisis or contingency? We don't know that. That's a very difficult situation, but that's the reality. Looking at it as a taboo or simply not discussing those matters, if you just spend time not discussing them, when you're confronted with such a crisis, you will just get confused which happened in the past. Put simply, not discussing contingencies. There are actually people who appreciate not discussing those things. Bureaucratic organization. If you look at the bureaucratic institution, they are vested interests of the ministry. They have their certain mission, and there are people assigned to them. If the work gets reduced, then there will be more people that will be problematic for the people. And so the ministry tends to have the, secure their own work. Then there is a kind of a silo structure in administration during peace times. So it can be efficient. The ministry that has expertise takes the lead, manages things, so that's important. But in time of contingency, realignment based on function is required so that most effectively responding to a contingency, they need to define how ministry will function. But if you start discussing those things, then there are risks that vested interest may be damaged. So no incentives for them to get to sit together at one table. And then there are actually people who do not want to have a discussion for contingency. It might be difficult for you to say, Anegawa-san, but looking back that nuclear accident, there was that safety myth for electricity operator spending initial cost, you build the nuclear power plant as much as possible, continue operation of that nuclear power plant. That was the ultimate goal. Any actions that would hinder that would be regarded as risks. So compared, rather than the nuclear accident risk, not being able to operate the power plant, that risk was regarded as a more serious risk. But for that safety myth, I think People did not really want to uh, discuss contingency, if that's possible at all. So crisis management on the part of the government and with the electricity op operator, there was a very, they were uh, interest to aligned, like the honeymoon period. So first responder is given as one of the topics today. <laughs> when out of control, who will actually guard to protect the peoples of life? Who will risk lives to rescue people? That discussion is avoided. So this contingency discussion is avoided. Most of the Japanese people think that in the case of contingency, SDF will be deployed. But deployment of SDF in the case of contingency is still considered taboo for Japanese people. So that discussion was also avoided and crisis management has not really been improved. Contingency should not happen. 
waging war, taking initiatives to wage a war, that should never, ever happen. And Japan has pledged not to wage a war. That being the case, looking at the possible contingency and then protect us, protect people. That kind of a sound discussion for contingency is demanded and requested. That was more or less my impression, but thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. That was very deep. Just taking up this topic, we could go on discussing this matter for several hours. This is a very difficult topic, starting with the history of war and the approach that Japan takes on contingencies. This is a topic that we really have to put all our minds and hearts to in discussing. But you have proposed this issue, and that was very significant and meaningful. Now, moving on to Ms. Matsuzawa. You were involved in National Diet Investigation Commission. And for the first time in the history of Constitution, the National Diet conducted an accident investigation in a very open manner. And the process was transparent. So this was a very unique program. And as was discussed in the keynote, Chairman Funabashi said that oversight by people in a democratic way, oversight of the government by the people, from that perspective, the activities of the National Diet Investigation Commission was very meaningful. So Ms. Matsudawa, since you have been involved in this directly, if you could talk about how you view it, how you assess it, and over the past 10 years, democratic oversight by the people, how should it be and how is it now? How has it changed? If you could share with us your thoughts about these things. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Suzuki. I was formally Research Director of the National Diet Investigation Commission. My name is Matsuzawa. The commission has already been dissolved, so what I'm going to say is just my personal opinion. So my direct response to what you have asked is that government oversight by the national diet is still not sufficient to the recommendations that we made. The responses were very limited. That is my view. And as you know, National Diet Investigation Commission, this was established based on the law on investigating Fukushima nuclear accident. So we did a research authority based on this law, and government operator, all stakeholders. Uh, we were independent from in the, uh, in these uh, stakeholders. We were objective, transparent, based on the principles of the national diet. So in that way, I think there is a great significance that the investigation commission was established for the first time in the history of the Constitution. But US, UK, such an investigation independent commission is established as a matter of course. And back in 2016, in the UK, their participation in the Iraq war, and the independent commission conducted an investigation for seven years. And although their weapons of mass destruction in Iraq was told to be a threat, but there was not sufficient basis as a result of the investigation. So such a review is conducted for government's important decision. So the governance significance is very big that the government decision can be reviewed by these independent commissions. Now, recommendation seven, utilization of the findings of the commission should be made use of, but this is not implemented. And to the regulators, national diets oversight, for example, nuclear accident problem special committee has been established. And the fact that it's been established is to be appreciated for, but they're only discussing about specific regulations. So as is pointed out in these findings of this report at API, 
as a committee that has expertise as par, on par, I have uh, some questions about the level of expertise and the level and depth of discussion that is taking place. So this investigation special committee, when we think about the role, the Nuclear Regulatory Regulation Authority assumes that there is already a nuclear power plant and the regulation is considered afterthought. So as for the continued operation of nuclear uh, power plant, uh, that is not being discussed. But for oversight of such administrative power, national diet, special investigative commission based on the lessons learned from 311, whether Japan can handle nuclear power. Do we have the will and capacity? The global trend is that the U.S. is also reducing nuclear power. So in that sense, such framework discussion is not sufficient yet. So these are some of my observations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Even today, the national diet, even though informality it is supposed to have an oversight, but uh, they are actually concentrating on the, to the individual aspects. So as I have mentioned in my keynote speech, uh, you think that it is quite safe when the regulation is uh, the made uh, the stricter. That still seems to be uh, the impression we uh, have. We need to have uh, the much uh, bigger uh, the framework and uh, the frame of mind, whether uh, you uh, have uh, the capability as well as uh, the will and decisiveness to continue the nuclear uh, the power, even going beyond uh, uh, the existing framework of the government, rather than having a good debate and deliberation on the nuclear energy itself, uh, you to, to just to take up uh, the specific aspect of whether this and that regulation uh, is good or bad. It is too, perhaps, uh, uh, the, uh, the fragmented or focused, as was mentioned by Mr. Anegawa. You need to have the overall thinking for the governance as a whole. And that seems to be perhaps still missing. You tend to discuss on the specifics rather, rather than having a general uh, debate, so to speak. That is still the tendency even today. There are questions that are being uh, written into the Q&A box. I don't think uh, we will be able to uh, take all the questions up in the interest of time, but can I read out the name? This is from Suntory Holdings, uh, the CEO, Mr. Ningami. Mr. Ninami, this is an impression, his comment rather than a question. In Japan, uh, what uh, Mr. Nomura has suggested, uh, that the examination of the process after the World War II is something critical. Uh, Japan should not make anything a taboo. Uh, we need to deepen uh, our uh, discussions. So Mr. Nomura, to make not make anything a taboo and have uh, in-depth discussion. Do you have any ideas to make this happen? Could you make some suggestions, perhaps? The most important thing, I believe, is what that could possibly happen going forward. We need to be forward-looking. So try uh, to pick up uh, the possible risks. Pandemic actually happened this time, but after the pandemic has actually occurred, people came to know that this is what is pandemic. But in the world, everyone was discussing that pandemic is coming, and there is a possibility that pandemic could happen. So many countries were quite prepared. But in Japan, that was never discussed. Why it is not put on our table? This is something strange. This is what I would like to question. 
earlier, I had to have uh, uh, actually had to mention the more from the bird's eye the view. But when we think of what is happening in front of us and the different potential and possibilities, I'm sure you would be able to come up with all sorts of different ideas to make improvements. So we should be more forward looking. And as uh, everyone else in the world is thinking about what could possibly happen, the incidents, any events, people think that we are too far distant. For, for example, if you arrive on the Mars, and uh, because we were able to discover ice, so maybe there could be some living beings, and if we bring something back to the Earth, uh, that could uh, devastate the ecosystem on Earth. That needs to be discussed. But normally, we don't have the debate right now. It is not the commonly accepted wisdom in Japan. When we bring these questions up, people say that you are strange. But globally, people are already discussing, and all sorts of solutions are suggested. Why is Japan not committed to such debate? That is something that we need to do. That should be the starting point for this country. Thank you. So concerning the crisis management, uh, you need the imagination being away from what you see right in front of you and thinking about the possibilities or potential. You need to exercise your mind. I couldn't agree with you more. Next. In the Stania Independent Investigation Commission, I did some hearing activities. The former NRC, Charles Cust. I have a question from Charles. For nuclear safety, is it the regulatory authority or companies who have greater responsibility? What level of risks are acceptable risks? What level of risks are acceptable risks? The questions to that effect have been posed. Anegawa-san. Mr. Anegawa, would you like to address those questions? About safety regulations. For nuclear safety, who plays greater role? Regulatory side or the company side? Uh, to what level of risks are considered acceptable risks? Answer to the first question is pretty simple, very explicit. Companies or the operators. It's not that it's it said so in laws or regulations, as I said before. Something that we couldn't swallow. I don't. What about the airline companies? But uh, we are taking flight. So if you're not convinced, you don't, you cannot fly airplane if you're not convinced. So in this case, not just people who happen to be on board, including the citizens who lived in that stricken area, there were significant impact. Some people went there to handle the post-accident matters, people's lives are exposed. So unless you are convinced, perhaps that's a different way of saying that we are responsible or feeling responsible. So it, that rests with the private sector, the operator. Now, as for the acceptable risks, it's difficult to meeting regulatory requirements. That's necessary, but that's not sufficient. Are there such, such conditions that can be considered sufficient? It's difficult. But insights, techni technical knowledge, at the cutting edge of such foresight and pursue them 
to the maximum point possible. Perhaps that might be the condition for sufficiency. At a certain point in time, if you clear a certain target after three years, that would cannot be or could not be in some cases sufficient. So it's not a fixed target. Not the fixed target, but at, at each given time, science and technology, measures, knowledge, you mobilize all of them and you come up with the cutting edge measures where you can be feeling comfortable with. If I could dare call that the target, I would say that's the target. Thank you very much. Then, Turning to the next question, this is from Ando-san. For the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant in the decommissioning for the plant, and also very recent, uh, uh, the earthquake that happened offshore of Fukushima, there seems to have been some trouble that happened. And uh, where lies the responsibility? It's not uh, to really hit the clear. And as the NRA, that has been established, uh, the NRA, uh, the Hedemeti, and TEPCO, they are all of the sort of waiting for the other to take action, so to speak. So who should take the initiative? Who uh, should uh, become responsible to, to take action? And who uh, should uh, try to assume uh, the responsibility or the liability? This is a question being asked. So well, can I ask uh, perhaps uh, Matsuna-san to respond? Yes, thank you for uh, the, uh, the question. For the trouble to do with the nuclear uh, the reactor and the explanation uh, to uh, the be uh, given, that is how I have understood the gist of the question to be. As Mr. Anegawa uh, has explained, what is happening on the site, that, that is the responsibility of the operators, the licensees. So primarily, it should be the licensee that should provide the explanation as to what is happening. But having said so, the METI, as well as NRA, and also the NR, uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission Secretariat, in terms of risk communication. Risk communication is important for everyone. And what should be the process, and what should be the initiator, uh, the entity, uh, to provide the uh, communication. But we need to, first of all, think about the objective and goal, uh, to give proper explanation uh, to the general public and uh, to explain the facts so that people will be able to feel uh, safe and secure. So not just formality as to the responsibility. The three parties, all of them, needs to uh, resume the responsibility and assume the responsibility and give explanation properly to the public. Thank you. What about the roles and the responsibility, responsibilities, division of responsibilities? It's not perfunctory matter, but in some terms of substance, as Adengawa Sam mentioned, the operator and the government they have to be fully convinced and they have to be fully confident to do so. I think that matters. May I? May I? This is Nomura. Uh, Professor Nomura, floor yours. As Matsuzawa mentioned, the operator has to assume responsibility, but in the case of accident from the Prime Minister's office, the operator in the press conference said something that Prime Minister PM office had not been reported to. And then PM office said, actually, first inform us and then do the press conference. Why such a thing did happen? And we need to resolve this issue. Otherwise, primarily, we say primarily operators should be held responsible. But once that kind of a thing should happen, they would say, we haven't reported to the prime minister's office, so we, let's refrain from giving a press conference. I mean, that's inevitable. So the accurate risk communication, one voice, I, we could understand that. But all that procedure-related discussion covering detail, we need to sort that out. If we just say concept-wise that the operator should be held responsible, I mean, this has not been addressed at all. The same, exactly the same thing happened in the 
COVID response. So we need to really revisit this. That's my impression. On that point, Mr. Anegawa, any comment from your side? Earlier, when, we, when I talked about communication, I said that it is true, the government and to the, from the regulatory authority, like Mr. Nomura said, when there are such requests to be made, yes, it is a fact that TEPCO uh, became very nervous, and that could happen again. But we believe that we have the responsibility to explain. So it would be good if some responses could be taken by the government. But what we should do within TEPCO is that evacuating the residents, evacuation of the residents. But if there is excessive uh, evacuation, there could be also another risk. So appropriate information provision is very important for the residents. So having the mindset to have priority on that, we believe that we need to have that strong resolve and determination. Thank you very much. Next. This is also a question for Mr. Anegawa. This is a question from Mr. Muramatsu. Regional disaster present, prevention plans, are they sufficient from the viewpoint of the operator? Local governments, in order to make continuous improvements, there has to be cooperation to be offered by the operators, Japanese operators. Are they providing sufficient support and cooperation? How is it that they are having communication with local governments? That's the question for you. So, if you could please respond. Naturally, we will make all out efforts to try to make the evacuation plan better. We need to support the municipalities for this purpose. I was asked to give my testimony back in 2015 at the National Diet, I exactly said the same thing, not for ourselves, but for the residents. Who are the residents? Definition would be difficult, but the majority of the residents, when they think that this level of uh, uh, preparation and plan would be adequate enough, we need to have them understand and be convinced. So we should try to support and help well, we may be blamed that we are the ones responsible, or so we may be criticized, but we would like to support the municipalities to draft a plan which would be adequate enough. That is also a major responsibility of ours, is what we understand the things to be. Thank you. And there is a question from Tsuda-san. For the big companies in Japan, uh, the president or CEOs that often change from time to time uh, in the interval of uh, six years or so. So it may be rather difficult for such uh, people uh, to take on the responsibility. So, uh, Mr. Nomura, uh, since uh, you are also involved in the business operation as well, so if you could please respond to this question. Up until now, looking at the governance of the Japanese uh, the businesses, as the questioner rightly points out, especially for the big companies, uh, there are people selected in a certain age category, and uh, they would continue for five or six years, and uh, they would hand over the baton to the successor. But handing over uh, to your successor, you would choose somebody you feel comfortable uh, that uh, this person would be truly able to exercise good leadership or responsibility. But this is no longer uh, the governance uh, to which we uh, viable for Japanese companies uh, to compete in the whole world. We need to have a business model uh, which will be convincing enough for every kind of stakeholder. And then I believe uh, we will be able uh, to, uh, to have uh, the good understanding. And the succession plan matters. Uh, so 
So the top manager needs to think about who should uh, uh, be able uh, to be take on the leadership. So people who are qualified to take on the mission of the leadership. And if you would like to become the CEO, you need to, to change yourselves uh, to acquire the capability that enable her to execute uh, the, the mission. So for the safe, uh, safe and secure nuclear power, this is something of uh, the a um, uh, a um, uh, uh, the, uh, the elementary uh, the aspect, and you need to have a good understanding of that. So the succession plan needs to be drafted properly so that you should not uh, uh, pick who you like, uh, but uh, try to, to select the people who would uh, meet the necessary mission. I'm not uh, thinking about uh, uh, the Japanese uh, the businesses individually, but if you would go for uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the polar star, uh, the that is how you need to be ambitious of. As to the sense of crisis of the top management that has been criticized in the reports, so Mr. Anigar, would you also like to respond? Earlier, I was only able to speak very briefly on this topic. The management, top management, who educates them? There are difficulties involved. After the accident, as we conducted various research, especially in the United States, various people get to the top, especially there are frequent occurrences where an external person comes in to become the CEO. So basic nuclear power course, nuclear agencies and universities provide them with education for about one month. There is an intensive training session. They have such a system. But in Japan, we don't have a, such a system. Yes, we should aim for that. But at TEPCO, including managers who are not conducting governance directly on nuclear power, the nuclear division knows most about nuclear power, so internally there has to be such training and education to teach the top management about nuclear power. We do have such a system in place, but we believe that this has to be turned into something more robust and strengthened, because when there's a turnover of the top person, there will be some concerns. So we are continuing to make improvements in that area. So inside a company, uh, try to educate the top uh, management there may be something uh, difficult to do. I do understand when it comes to uh, business management. I never have had my, the experience myself, uh, so uh, I can only imagine. Uh, but uh, uh, the question of uh, the management and responsibility seems to be uh, the very important question. A simi there's a similar question from Sato-san. Not uh, only for the nuclear power, but when government responds to a crisis, uh, the ministers, including the prime minister, may not be experts or specialists on crisis management. In most of uh, the cases, including the nuclear energy, they do, they do not have the expertise. They are a layman, so to speak. So politicians without the expertise, but they need to make the decision. But then what would be the role to be played by the experts? What should be the balance to be struck between such politicians and the experts? So, Matsuzawa-san, would you be able to respond? Do you have uh, any comments to make? Yes, thank you. For the COVID-19 investigation, I am uh, being involved to a certain extent. How to retain the private sector professionals and how uh, to reflect 
uh, their knowledge and findings into the policy making, uh, the division of role and check and balance, and uh, the mutual uh, the oversight and monitoring. Uh, those things are not re really clearly set in Japan. First of all, uh, for the private sector people uh, to be employed and retained by experts, uh, the procedure is too complicated and it's too time consuming. So when a contingency happens, to employ very quickly is something difficult to do in this country. And for the experts, they would like uh, to preserve their independence and be able uh, to give advice as experts. Uh, the final decision-making should be the politicians who have been selected by the Japanese people. But as it says here, uh, the professionals, experts' advice needs to be respected as well. If not, uh, there will be criticism that the decision-makers, policy-makers may be ignoring uh, the, uh, the experts, uh, the his suggestions. I mean, uh, People need to understand the role to be played by the experts, and we need the proper uh, system uh, to reflect uh, those ideas. That is not being done in Japan as well. So, Mr. Nomura, I would like to hear your comments, please. <laughs> okay, you forced to me. Matsuda-san, you made a comment in that regard, but we have to be careful about the following thing. Japanese experts, professionals, among those professionals and experts, Quite a number of people act in a rather political manner without having independence, without the pride that you have to be independent. Sometimes people behave as if they were a minister. Now, that's least desirable. On the other hand, politicians who are half informed, they are no good. When nuclear power accident occurred, we saw that phenomenon in that particular field. It happens to be that if you graduated from a certain faculty, certain department of university, he or she may think that they have certain expertise and they prioritize their own insights. So mutually holding people in check, that matters, that's important. So it's important how to ensure that mutual, mutually holding in check. We saw this in the COVID as well, those experts. It's difficult for them to fully stationed in ministry, just like the reserve soldiers, like a group of people who would be called upon in case of emergency, and then that should be built. Always in communication, always trying to brush up their expertise. Such an organization should be established on various themes and ensuring having that group of experts available. That's important. You kindly gave me this opportunity. You talked about this president, but the education of presidents or CEOs learning something that's important, but in the case of Japan, many people have been working for the company all their lives. So people who have come from risk management becoming the CEO, that kind of career path is important in case corporate planning division, for instance, people who tend to work in the corporate planning division tends to become president. But the second line of defense, third line of defense, who are in the low and steady profile. You hear about the teaching hospital and medical school, those people who have not experienced working in the hospital, who is managing the university. That could be one of the factors of malpractice or accidents at hospital, be it hospital or be it other thing, that you need to experience those things firsthand. That's the career path we need. Thank you. Thank you very much. When you think in more concrete terms, the expertise and uh, the management, uh, business management and decision making, there may be some contradictions, but sometimes uh, uh, we need uh, to strike a balance. So the relationship between the experts and politicians, uh, this is something of a major issue. Uh, we could. Uh, uh, dwell further. I myself am involved in policy making for science and technology, so I am often thinking about this issue myself. Mr. Nomura, 
uh, you have uh, pointed out earlier, the scientists and experts, amongst them, there are people uh, who aspire to gain power, and uh, they have their own interests, monetary interests, and so forth. So what? how to coordinate the different interests? So you should have a discerning eye to choose the right person. The politicians should have the discerning eye. Uh, the professionals group or the researchers group, whether you have that discerning eye or not matters very much. But uh, the bureaucrats and the politicians, they tend to handpick uh, those academics who they will be able uh, to represent their own interests. Uh, interests of politicians and the bureaucracy. So it is highly complicated. So there are other inherent problems there as well. Now there is another question here. This is a Katsuritsama san. Uh, with the discussion and examination being made with scientific uh, the, the knowledge. It could be utilized for political decision making, but uh, there could be different interests involved and the different uh, positions of the people that may conflict with each other. Scientific knowledge may be there, but when it comes to political decision making, when the decision making process itself have not changed. Now, more recently, uh, the Digital Affairs Agency it has been newly established. This is also something relevant. As technology progresses, uh, you need uh, to further improve on the decision-making process as well. Meeting the new demands and different demands, but how to go about that? That, I believe, is the point of the question. So, uh, Ms. Matsuzawa. And also, also, Mr. Nomura, if you could please respond to this question. Yes, thank you. As often as question, I have to say, you cannot uh, really uh, deny the decision made uh, in the past. That is to say that there is no fallacy. That is kind of the mindset, uh, be it the scientific findings and, uh, and uh, the decisions and policy making. Everything would uh, be evolving and developing. So we need to review on things as time passes. Uh, at that time, the scientific uh, knowledge may have been proper and appropriate, but uh, the mankind becomes wiser and smarter, so that the progress is seen it needs to be understood and accepted. And that is uh, what is questionable in many cases. For example, the responsibility of uh, the board members, in accordance with the company law, uh, you need to make a judgment whether what you have decided is actually proper or not. But the premise at the time um, is fine, but uh, criticism often happens based upon uh, the knowledge and the progress of uh, uh, the, uh, the science today. And look, looking back, based upon your knowledge today, you will be often uh, be criticized because the decision was not proper. But perhaps we need to change uh, our way of thinking, including myself. We need to update uh, our way of thinking that uh, sometimes uh, what government has decided they may have been quite the proper uh, at that time. and But they also need to be flexible to change and evolve. And we need to provide a good positive assessment for uh, such change. I think that's a very important comment, uh, Professor Nomura. I think Suzuki says, Professor Suzuki, you should address this question. You should. Uh, so I'll be brief, just one word about appraisal or evaluation of people. It's pretty limited, and it's really people scores are given, and then if you fail, then then you lose points. But that needs to be changed from different axes, as Masuzawa mentioned in the past. 
If the greatest performance given, then that should be appreciated. When people try to improve what they do, then if they can earn additional scores, then that should incentivize people. As for the mass media, I talked about, touched upon this before. I mean, if, in mass media, if they criticize something, then they would get viewing rate. If they start discussing improvement, then people switch the TV channel. So people are actually dancing on their palms in a way, and unless you talk about the reform or improvement, then that's it. They are wanting that kind of viewpoint should be nurtured. That kind of mass media is important, and also in terms of appraisal evaluation, I think that could actually actually play a role here. Thank you, Professor Nomura. Yes, that's this is indeed something that I should address as well. Right. Resistance against improvement. Or people are perplexed whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. People don't know for certain, as Professor Nomura said. There's no system for evaluation. I think that's the biggest cause. But there's another factor, factor Matsuzawa mentioned. There's the presumption that there should be no failures, including the mass media, that infallibility that mass media, including the, the public society, the government must be always right. I think that can be can have a kind of a suffocating effect too, rather than addressing problems in a logical, reasonable way, making sure that you won't be attacked, you won't be criticized, make sure that you have an excuse, kind of having an alibi, that combination of such things. In the 10-year invest, independent investigation commission, what concerned us was the following. NRA and the, the operator's dialogue, they are all open to the public because of that, in a way, people cannot afford to make any errors. And they cannot speak boldly because it's all open. If you say something a little weird, then people are afraid they might be criticized. That's the kind of risk that they have. So as a result, it's a kind of a perfunctory dialogue between the two. I said homework type of regulation. And as one such example, the regulatory authority and those who are regulated, that relation is more or less fixed. So on this, Anegawa-san, in terms of NRA, if you would like to share with us any comment. Thank you. about the NRA. I'm not in a position to say things about the NRA. But I would suppose that the regulations themselves are changing, or at least I have that expectation. Homework-based regulation, according to the report. But looking at the performance of the operator, with that perspective to change the inspection system, that attempt is currently underway. Credit system or performance-based regulation to look at your performance, I think that is better. But at the same time, for a teacher, it will be difficult for them to give scores to the operator. It's more labor intensive, but the regulators themselves looking at good examples and good practices overseas. So the operator should, with their own initiative, try to identify problems to make improvements on their own. And for those operators who are doing exactly that, then the regulators should not be so concerned. But for those operators who are not able to do that, they will be strictly supervised. Such a framework is now starting to be established. So this is an emergence out of the homework-based regulation. So personally speaking, I have a lot of hope. Thank you. So performance-based evaluation. Uh, 
I, yes, I knew about it, but to share with you a kind of a backstage story. Since the Fukushima accident, tenure evaluation, the investigation, this started before COVID. While I was still writing this, the COVID-19 started. And then I was asked to participate in this API, ICJC. So I couldn't do both of them together. I didn't have time to embed those new insights. And then we had to end up publishing this. So, Mia Kappa, but about a performance-based evaluation type of regulation, embedding that for us to say to exit from the homework type of regulation. It's an attempt to that right direction, and we appreciate that, and I hope that it will grow in the, the future. I, we are running out of time, but I actually received the question myself. Fukushima nuclear power plant, the, there was the final investigation. But what about this? Before the edge of API, there was a predecessor organization. As such an organization, we addressed that. And the, uh, the predecessor organization was transformed into API. So as the Independent Investigation Commission, that task is now finished. During this 10-year look back, that's what we do. I hope you will interpret in this way going forward. Decommissioning work is ongoing. The causes of the accident, when they are elucidated, then on that occasion, separately, the validating that verification is possible. But with regard to that, technical expertise insight would be necessary. But it, this investigation commission, rather than technical verification by engineers, this is really the verification of governance itself about the nuclear accident. The, the tenure is the kind of a milestone. About this investigation the commission, we didn't address the administrative rights. Why? The prime minister offices crisis management about governance on administrative rights. There's no chapter dedicated to that, but in various parts of the report, I believe that matter is addressed. So I hope we will take a look at the report. It's almost time, but last but not least, from three of you, just one word about the 10-year, based on the 10-year verification about the nuclear administration, about Japan's crisis management. One word from each of you. Anegawa-san. No, then Professor Nomura and then Matsuzawa-san in this order. Briefly, please, Anegawa-san. Well, this 10-year investigation commission report, I have read this report, and there are things that are discussed in this report that I haven't identified as problems myself. Uh, I'm very thankful. We don't believe that we're relaxed, but it's always very valuable to get such insight from the outside. It makes us be more aware of the issues. So 10 years at this juncture, this report is being published. We're very thankful for this. Thank you. Next, turning to Mr. Nomura, let me just say a word. With this opportunity, there are many things that we have found out as a result of discussion. So this was very good, especially at a 10-year review, new insights that have been identified. This is something that we need to share and pass it on to the next generation. And for example, to Japan, if there is to be a big cyber attack and various infrastructure paralyzed and economic activity disrupted, if such a situation happens, then once again, are we going to do the same thing again? We hope to avoid that at all costs. So 
because since though we don't know what would happen, there are common threads, common causes. We have already identified them. So not just pointing them out, but we have to start the work of making corrections and making improvements. How should we go about doing that? Yes, there were questions raised. And yes, I wasn't able to address all of these questions, but we have to really think about that. How are we going to overcome these problems the next time around? We hope to have another opportunity to discuss these matters. Then Matsuda-san, please. Yes, it was an invaluable opportunity for me. Thank you very much for uh, giving me uh, this opportunity. So this is the 10th uh, year anniversary. It is quite sad that we need to do this. Uh, to follow up on the National Diet Investigation Commission, uh, the process has been gone through by Hishibashi San of our own investigation commission. Uh, but the governance at the National Diet has not been improved. What kind of recommendation could we put forward to make change, to uh, make a difference, as Mr. Nomurahat uh, has uh, uh, said, how to retain uh, the professionals and uh, experts in the COVID-19 uh, pandemic as well? This has also been debated. I hope that we will be able to see good improvements going forward. Thank you very much once again for this invaluable opportunity. Thank you. When we look at the 10 years review, Japan have gone through different experiences, and I believe that we will be able to make progress step by step. But as Mr. Nomura has suggested, the post-war or Japan, uh, we need to examine ourselves, and that has not been properly done yet. So that is a major question. So there is a deep-rooted uh, uh, the problem uh, that uh, uh, there has been changes not happening in many ways, but uh, uh, the incidents will happen. Uh, events that would occur from time to time, and we should not repeat our mistake. And uh, the examination is not something to be done on a one-off basis. We need to bring about a virtuous cycle of making improvements. Uh, the examination itself is not uh, our goal. To make a difference through examination is what we need to achieve. So, Mr. Anegawa, you heard have uh, formulated the nuclear safety reform had the plan uh, to make uh, today better than yesterday and make tomorrow better than uh, today. Not uh, just for TEPCO, but the government uh, needs to adopt this way of thinking uh, to make better the crisis management and make better uh, the governance and how to respond. And I hope that our report if we could contribute in this vein, uh, we would be indeed uh, uh, very uh, delighted. I would like to thank the three panelists uh, for a uh, good uh, 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 insights and the suggestions. I would like to thank the audience for asking good questions. So this was a very good learning experience for all of us. And with this, I would like to close the panel discussion. Thank you.